before we begin, let us just start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would use me, Lord, in a mighty way, that hearts would be changed and that minds would be focused and centered on you. We pray, Lord, that it would not be my words, but your words spoken here today, that someone would be inspired to have a change of heart, change of life, and to follow you wholly. These mercies I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's sermon is called, No Uninvited Guests. And I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 22, verses 2 to 14. Matthew 22, verses 2 to 14. And I'm going to read from the New International Version. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that, they, that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, went to his field, Another to his business. The rest seized the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I have invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. The king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Now, the last phrase of the parable really stands out to me. Many are invited, but few are chosen, particularly the word chosen. The word chosen used here is the same exact word that's used when God calls us the elect. So in other words, the scripture is saying many are chosen. Sorry, many are called. Many are invited. But few are elect. Many are called or invited to come to church. Many are called or invited to give their hearts to Jesus. Many are called or invited to surrender sinful practices and lifestyles. Many are called or invited to take a more active role in ministry. But few are elect. Here the scripture is indicating that many people are invited to be part of the elect, but few actually become the elect. Think about a career fair, for example. Many are invited to career fairs, but only few people get the job. The key thing to take from all this is that generally, it is not because of an unwillingness on the part of the employer to hire. In the same way, God is inviting us to be his elect. And unlike the employer, the, uh, the employer God has enough space, enough position for every single person that he invites. But the scripture says, few are chosen. And that should bother us. I mean, it bothers me. Does it bother you? That should bother us. Few 
are chosen. And the reason why it bothers me is because many are called to be baptized, but few go down into the pool. Many are called to serve in some capacity, but few want the responsibility. Many are called to be saved, but few choose to be. This text is saying that the problem is not with God, but the problem is with us. You see, the hiring sign is on the door. The position is open, but many are dropping the ball. Now, if we take anything from this, it should be that if many are called, but few are chosen, then it stands to reason that the majority are not right. The psalmist puts it this way, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Pay close attention to verse 5. I'm going to take you back to Matthew chapter 22. And I want us to pay close attention to verse 5 because I believe there's a message here for Macedonia. The king invites the servants to this wedding. But the problem is not that there are not enough seats to fit the guests. The problem, as the King James puts it, is that, what? They made light of it. In other words, they just put the whole thing off. Jesus did not tell parables because they made interesting stories. But here, Jesus had a point. The point that he was making was that many who are invited to be a part of the kingdom of God are putting off the invitation. Now, recently... I had the distinct pleasure of learning what it's like to invite guests to a wedding reception. And when you speak to people, they tell you that if you invite about 200, you can expect how much? 150. Why? I, in, in every wedding, every wedding, there are people who put off the invitation, either by not responding or they say they're coming, but then the day of, they may not show up. Now, the problem is what? Any married people in here? What's the problem? The problem is that the, the, the seat has already been paid for. Now, my reason for this illustration is to point out that your purchase seat in the kingdom of God has already been, what? Paid for. And it cost the blood of Jesus. And many of us are putting off the invitation. How do we do that? Two ways. One, either we don't respond at all when the preacher gives altar call after call, or we respond, yes, we're coming. We come to church every Sabbath. We sit in the pews. But by the way that we live, our lifestyles, the sins that we're still holding on to, our refusal to give up certain things, we have responded yes to the invitation, but our actions are suggesting that we're not coming. Maybe I confuse someone. Maybe, maybe there are some who think that you can come to church every Sabbath and that you've done your part. That's it. That's all you have to do. And it's similar to the wedding guest. He showed up. He was there. He thought he was good to go. But there was a problem, wasn't there? The problem was that even though he showed up, he didn't, have on, he didn't come right. And there's a lesson in that for us. Even if the first step is that you respond to the invitation. But after you have responded to the invitation, which is the very important first step, we have to show up and show up right. Amen. Now, don't put off your invitation any longer. You are being called. Amen. You know, there's actually a process when you put something off, and it starts in the mind. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 tells us, The heart is deceitfully wicked 
sorry, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The mind fights the most powerful battles. It has the greatest influence over everything in the human body. For example, the mind can make a sick person feel healthy. The mind can make a healthy person feel sick. But the greatest battle that the mind fights is actually against God. Because the problem with us is that we rationalize. The word rationalization means to be conformable to human reason. It is to treat something or explain something in a way that makes sense to the individual. According to dictionary.com, it can also mean to ascribe one's acts, opinions, etc., to causes that superficially seem reasonable and valid, but actually are unrelated to the true, possibly unconscious, and often less creditable or agreeable causes. Or in short, we are guilty of trying to make things we can't understand make sense to us, and we walk by sight instead of by faith. What does that mean? That means that when situations come up that require us to act based on faith, we wait for a sign. That means that when the preacher makes an altar call, we're waiting for a special miracle that will bring us down the aisle. That means that when we're asked to do something, we wait for divine intervention before we lift a finger. Rationalization is when the children of Israel saw an army behind them and a sea in front of them. And they rationalized. We would have been better off back in Egypt. Rationalization is when the religious leaders of Jesus' time refused to accept him as the Messiah. Why? Because Jesus was not the Messiah that they had conceptualized. He was not the Messiah that they had reasoned out. Rationalization is when the commandments say, Thou shalt not. And we start to think about all the reasons why we should. For example, thou shalt not commit adultery. And we rationalize. My wife doesn't really treat me all that good. My husband would do it if he had the chance. Rationalization. Here's another example. Thou shalt not steal. And we rationalize. They got money. They can afford it. Rationalization. Here's another example. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we rationalize. So many religions in the world, how do you know which one's the right one? Rationalization. Here's another example. Honor thy father and thy mother. And we rationalize. My parents don't understand me. Rationalization. Or here's another one. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And we rationalize. God has to understand I have to work. I need the money. I can worship God any day of the week. Rationalization. If I had to choose one word to describe rationalization, the word would be excuses. The worst thing about rationalization is that we lie to ourselves. It's one thing when you're dishonest with somebody else, but it's a whole other thing, a whole other problem when you're dishonest with yourself. If you're not honest with yourself, then you're selling yourself short. It's the devil's plan to get us to be dishonest with ourselves. Why? Because when we're dishonest with ourselves, it's more difficult for God to reason with us. How we respond to God becomes about rationalizing, fitting things into understanding that we're willing to accept, leaning to our own understanding, doing things that we want to do, accepting only the parts of scripture that don't cut us at the heart. Part of the reason why we rationalize is because we're afraid of change. Accepting truth requires you to do something about the truth. If you can rationalize, you can water it down. If you can water it down, 
you can delay it. And if you can delay it, you can put it off. If you can rationalize, you can enjoy the pleasures of sin just a little while longer. You know, when Nathan approached David, you'll notice that he didn't come right out and tell him that he was a sinner. First, he tells him his own story in the form of a parable. And when, only when David had condemned himself, then Nathan said, thou art the man. A lot of times we know when we're doing something wrong. Nobody has to tell us or point it out to us. We know. But we must be careful that we don't become comfortable in sin. When you rationalize, you water down conviction. When you water down conviction, you get comfortable because there's nothing telling you or impressing on you that you're doing something wrong. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. When you rationalize, you're not listening to God, chances are. And if you stop listening to God, then God stops talking. Turn with me in your Bibles to Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. There's a warning here for us. And we're going to read from verse 11 and 12. Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but the hearing of the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro, seeking a word from the Lord, and shall not find it. Now, there's a time coming when probation will be cut off. There's a time coming when they will be wishing We'll be wishing that we paid a little bit more attention during the sermon. Bibles may not be readily available. Those who don't agree with the majority will be called the enemies of God. Many will seek truth, but shall not find it. Yet, we rationalize. Sometimes we justify sleeping in church, sleeping throughout the service and all throughout the sermon. And we rationalize that too. The speaker is boring. But what if God had a special message for you in that sermon that you missed because you rationalized the speaker? God can use anybody. Am I right? Amen. God can use anybody. Now, yet we don't treat everybody like somebody that God is using. We rationalize. We judge the messenger and pay little attention, if any, to the message. What if that sermon was God speaking to you in a still, small voice? Sometimes we seek to be entertained at church, and we're more interested in being entertained than we are about learning something. Now, I will be the first to tell you that not everybody that can yell, holler, and scream into a microphone knows what they're talking about. How do I know that? How did God speak to Elijah? Let's take a look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. How did God speak to Elijah when he was in the cave? And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after that, after the wind, an earthquake. But the, earth, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, what? A fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Elijah was in the cave because he rationalized. Jezebel said she was going to kill him, and he rationalized. He was afraid for his life. He went to the cave. He rationalized. That's why he was in the cave. And many of us today are in the caves that we're in because we, too, rationalize. And God is saying to some of us today, what doest thou here? 
God has already given us instructions. God has already told us what he wants us to do. Yet many of us are just not doing it. Like the servants invited to the wedding, we're putting off the invitation. God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Now, if people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, why don't we see more attendance and participation in Bible study? Every single one of us has sin that we rationalize. There's some places we're not supposed to go, and we go, and we want God to forgive us for going or even go with us. There's some things that we're not supposed to watch, and we rationalize, we watch. There's some things that God told us not to do, and we do it, and we ask God to bless it. There's some things that God asks us to give up, and we rationalize why we still need to hold on to it just a while longer. There's somebody in a relationship right now, and they know they have no business being in that relationship, and they are rationalizing, going through all the positive things about the relationship, all the positive things about the person, all the reasons why they think it can work. They're making excuses for that relationship. There's somebody who needs to get baptized. They've seen what the Bible says, and yet, they're rationalizing, not ready to make a commitment. One of the worst lies that the devil tells us is that we have time. But we're not promised tomorrow. Jesus said, he that is not with me is what? Against me. And he that gathereth not with me does what? Scattereth abroad. John said, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is what? Righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So the Bible is clear. Yet many times we wrestle and we rationalize whether or not we're going to obey God. We wait for signs and miracles to do things that God has already made clear that he wants us to do. You don't need any sort of miracle to tell you to keep God's commandments. He already made it clear when he spoke it on Mount Sinai. <clears throat> but we're rationalizing. I'll serve God later. I'm not ready yet. Maybe when I get older. Moreover, the Lord spoke again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it, either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. This Ahaz didn't say because he was a pious king. Ahaz was actually one of the wicked kings. But the reason Ahaz said it is because he understood that when God gives clear instructions, it is tempting or provoking him to ask for a sign. The sign is that God made it clear. The message for us today is to stop putting off the invitation. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 26. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 26. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life shall find it. Now, a lot of times we like the part that says, <coughs> follow me. But the part that says, deny self, that's where we have a problem. For what, for what man... For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? 
fornication, theft, robbery, violence. God does not accept rationalizing. The judgment has already begun. We don't realize that we're living in the time period of the first angel's message. What is the first angel's message? Fear God and what? Give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. Now, if the hour of his judgment is come, then that means that it's already here. If the hour of his judgment is already here, then that means that right now we are being judged. Now, if the judgment has already begun, then we must understand that all of our thoughts, our words, our actions are all being judged. We can't hide anything from God. We can hide it from each other. We can rationalize with each other. But God sees through all that. The scripture says that which is done in secret gets proclaimed where? Upon the housetops. So there's nothing that we can hide from God, even in our thoughts. God knows what you're struggling with. God knows the thoughts and intentions of every heart. God knows the wickedness and the deceitfulness of every heart. God knows your excuses. David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs and harps and lyres and tambourines and sistrums and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because of the oxen stumbling. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Now, Uzzah was a man who rationalized. It's the ark of God. It was going to fall. He knew that nobody was allowed to touch the ark except those who were appointed. Everybody knew that nobody was allowed to touch the ark. But he rationalized, given the circumstances, just this one time. Sometimes when we rationalize, we view ourselves as helping God out. God doesn't need our help. God needs us to trust him and obey him and recognize that we need his help. In closing, God is giving you an invitation. For every individual, that invitation may be similar or different. There are some who have responded to the invitation to join the church. And even though they're in the pews, physically present, they may be spiritually absent. You've been coming to church for a while, but maybe you're not spiritual. Maybe you've been coming, but you haven't used your talents to serve God and to win souls. Maybe you're one of the people who need to have your sins washed away in baptism. Even now, the devil has you rationalizing. The devil is giving you excuses, but God is giving you two things. An invitation and a choice. The servants in this parable, many of them took, made light of the invitation. Many will, many will think that someone else needs the invitation. Many, of, many are critiquing the person who's delivering the invitation, but will not accept the invitation. Is that you? Like the man who was caught without the wedding garment, many are in the church physically present, but not here spiritually. Many come every week and don't make any changes. You know, how often after a sermon is preached do you ever sit and contemplate 
things that you need to change about your life. Whether you just go out to the car and just sit and think for a few minutes or you're in the pew and you just don't leave the seat right away. You don't uh, get into a conversation right away, but you sit and you take time to think, what did that have to do with me? What must I do to be saved? Do we do that? What will you do with your invitation? Or will we hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you? So often we come to church and we get upset when ministers preach about sin. We get upset when ministers preach about uh, transformation or making changes. We forget that without dying to self and being born again, no one will enter into the kingdom of God. But in our hearts, we tell the prophets, prophesy not. We tell the preachers, don't talk about me. We tell the teachers, don't teach me things I don't want to learn. God has made the knowledge available. God has made the opportunity available. What are we doing with the invitation? Will someone here accept it? God may be calling you to make a greater commitment. Or maybe God is calling you to forsake your sins. Maybe there's something in your life that you know you need to get rid of. Maybe God is calling you out of the relationship that you're in that you know you shouldn't be in. Maybe God is calling you to get baptized. But whatever God is calling you for, he's calling you for a purpose. The closing hymn will be, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Stop rationalizing and be honest with yourself. Many are called, but who's chosen? Five ninety six. <laughs> 